Welcome to Coming Down to Earth, an online summit for exploring pathways towards more healthy and regenerative cultures. I'm Eva Schoenfeld and I'm here with Sophie Banks a week two of the summit uh, to talk about her take on um, on how we uh, on how well, the things that support us to do conflict better um, and to to find our way through that that sort of difficult landscape of conflict. So Sophie, the, you were going to start by by looking at the kind of the the the, the big level of uh, um, how we kind of create cultures that are are less likely to push us into those conflict zones. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and I and I think this is, you know, in some ways, this is the most important bit of the landscape, uh, isn't it? Is how um, how do we not how do we avoid conflict? Because I think conflict is healthy and important and it's serving a purpose. But how do we understand the patterns in our cultures uh, that help us to stay in a place of of, of resilience and well-being um, for much of the time? And uh, in the session that I did with you last week, that was uh, in week one, I talked a lot about nervous system states and about this uh, sense that there's a, a possibility for humans to exist in a ground state of relaxed action and relaxed rest, uh, where we're not stressed. So action, uh, action can be joyful, it can be playful, you know, it can be, it doesn't have to be driven. Um, and I think it's, I'm really curious about the number of places in our culture where we associate action and will with force and drive mm. and it crops up in many many places if you look up sympathetic nervous system it's actually called it's described as a fight flight system but that's the emergency part of our sympathetic nervous system mm. it's also what wakes us up in the morning and gets us out of bed mm. so what what kind of things help us to operate in that uh, in that place and i think there are some very basic things that we need as human beings and and these patterns again um, come across scale and they come throughout our lives so I think the work that's been done on attachment theory for young babies is really helpful pattern for understanding what we are as human beings and what we need for our nervous systems to be in a calm state um, and it's beautifully um, spoken to in a lot of the art of mentoring teachings uh, we're we are wired for connection and I think we're wired not only for human connection we're wired for connection to the natural world um, we're wired to to be seeking relationship all the time and to be held in life by those relationships and the joy and the beauty and the interest and the learning and the development and the stress and the complicatedness um, and the aliveness of all of that. So, 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 you know, one of the core things is to have relationships that are functioning well. And I think there are some practices that just really, really help with that. So uh, practices of welcoming each other, uh, practices of gratitude, appreciation, of celebrating when we've done something together and we've done it well, of noticing beauty, of, you know, of, Keeping on bringing our attention to what is good at good in life, and to noticing and um, sending our good energy back through these connections of relationship, and we can do that within ourselves. Noticing that for myself, self appreciation, you know, self celebration, but also in one to one relationships, it's very important in groups, especially groups that are operating with little resource. You know, actually. We can go a long way if we create a group culture where people are feeling constantly nourished by the relationships in it. Um, but also, you know, many people have written a lot about, you know, how severed we are from the natural world and practices of just being outside, letting nature, you know, connect us back up or allowing ourselves to be drawn out into the beauty of the natural world. Um, so I think that would be my sort of starting point. Um, mm. And, and you know, we, we, we spoke about this 
going out from that kind of ground state of relaxation. You know, I love the rhythms, um, the idea that rhythms of action and then rest and building those into our day as well, or building those into our seasons. Um, that again, just supports our sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system to do their jobs within our body. You know, that we go out and have challenging meetings or a stressful project, and then we have reflection and digestion time. Um, and one of the things that I saw the most in transition probably was that <clears throat> there was a constant drive to do. And as soon as one thing would be completed, there wasn't reflection, learning, appreciation, celebration, rest, uh, you know, a redreaming, a sense of deepening. It would be, right, we've done that, we've got to get on with the next thing, you know, driven by a very real sense of urgency. Mm. So, yeah, I think all of those patterns uh, really, really help us. And and I just want to spotlight one. So, you know, one of the things that I do and have done more since leaving transition is grief ceremonies. Um, you know, and, and that's part of my commitment and interest in collectively surfacing, expressing and making meaning of the pain that we're carrying and often don't have spaces for. And one of the strongest things in that is when people are welcomed back after expressing their grief. Mm -hmm. uh, so for some people, that is the most powerful moment of a four-day um, journey is that somebody has welcomed them after expressing grief and said, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and it's so unusual. Um, and to Bonfu, you know, who I mentioned in the last one from the Dagara people of Burkina Faso, for her... There was, she saw there's a constant need to welcome each other into life. Life is painful and challenging and difficult. Um, and, and if we're not constantly pulled back by each other, by people saying, you know, thank you, how lovely to see you. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for your grief. Thank you for your beautiful work. Thank you for your skills, you know, for your humor, whatever it is. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Pulling us into life. I think we drift off. You know, I think we drift off. So, so this feeling of really seeing each other, taking time to see each other, for me, is a really basic pattern. Well, yeah. it's, I, I'm, as, you're, as you're speaking, I'm kind of imagining a, a, a life that's like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Somebody, Jeremy, who I worked with, you know, was quoting that where some, some people were, the greeting is, how wonderful to see your beautiful face again. <laughs> you know, like. And, you know, it would just become like, how are you, wouldn't it? After a few days of that, it'd be like, well, whatever. <coughs> but the intention behind it is important. It's sure. Yeah. And, and, yeah, if it's meant, it goes in. Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah, and, and then you were, you, were, you were also talking about the kind of conflict conflict resilience mm. kind of groups and and even one-to-one -one relationships which which are kind of resilient so yeah conflict's going to happen and like you say it can be really productive and it, it necessary um so what is it in that resilience how do we build that that muscle that's okay with it mm. um i think it's really helpful to have a frame for what conflict is mm. uh, and i'm sure there's many different frames being offered you know what is conflict why does it happen um and there are two bits that i think is helpful to that, that i want to just include uh, in what i'm sharing so one is about the kind of storming stage of group so a lot of people have heard of that forming norming storming performing model of, of the stages of group group life uh, we used to teach it on the transition training and um a lovely reframe of that storming is there's now enough safety in the group that we can stop being polite to each other. And that's a good sign. And for a lot of people, they went, oh, thank God for that. You know, uh, we don't have to be worried because there's disagreement. So, you know, where we come out of that slightly held back polite stage, you know, which some groups never have, of course, but, you know, if your group has been polite to each other at the beginning and they're starting to be a bit more jostling or well actually I don't I don't agree with that or I'm, I'm not happy with the way we're doing things I think it's really helpful to say that's a good sign it means that people are feeling safe enough to to challenge things and then the second framing what is conflict is uh and this I, I had this most succinctly 
explained to me by, by Dominic Barter, uh, who's worked in Brazil and uh, developed restorative circles, um, brings a lot of NBC work into what he does. But he said conflict is is the system trying to update itself, uh, where there's resistance to that updating, uh, which is also yeah, also in process process work. But the bit he said is which I loved is that systems are always changing. They're all we're constantly updating. And this idea that we, you know, that we are never, we can't change people. We're constantly changing. And as we relate and we deepen our relationship and we get to know each other in a group, the system is changing all the time. And then a, a change needs to happen. And there's something in the way of that change happening. Mm. Um, so that's one source of conflict. You know, I think another one is simply uh, difference. Another one is there's not enough time. You know, there's these stresses that come in of lack of resource, um, whatever it is, uh, the, the natural stresses of us we work together. So one of the things that I, I've done um, that I think is really helpful is just to have as one of your practices, not right at the beginning probably, but at some point within your group, just to have some time to speak about what stresses you, you know, what are the things that are really trigger you, what do you do when you're stressed, and, um, and what do you need? So this, this sort of prevention, you know, it, it could be that, it could be something else, but actually to talk about stress, so not about conflict, but to talk about signals of stress and how to reach out and, uh, and let the relationships become supportive again at that moment of stress. I guess is the principle that I'm wanting to point to, that we understand that we're different in stress. Some people fly off the handle, some people shut down, some people cry, some people make jokes. You know, some people need a hug, some people need to walk for 10 minutes, cup of tea. Like, we're all different, and actually it can be a really helpful part of a group's journey to just learn a bit about each other, about stress. Um, and then, of course, there's lots that we can do about agreements. Um, so, again, there's, uh, sometimes I speak about groups that there are three dimensions to group life. Uh, this came from the Centre for Human Ecology in Holland, I think, is where I got it from. Mm. Uh, and the thing that groups tend to focus on is the task. What are we here to do? Yeah. Um, and, again, in transition, I saw this uh, really often. But the other two dimensions are the relationships and then the structures. Um, and I think that's a really profound model for human existence. <clears throat> um, and often the relationships get neglected, uh, especially in a group that tends to focus on tasks. Some groups tend to just focus on the relationships and the task gets neglected. It can happen in both ways. Mm. So the relational field, how are we building trust and getting to know each other? It's really, really important. Um, and sometimes a deeply trusting group can go through incredibly stressful times that would tear another group apart. But because there's a basic trust in each other's group, uh, goodness and goodwill and sense of understanding of how each other works, the group will hold together. Mm. And for me, the structures bit is about what knits those two things together. So, you know, what are our meeting processes? How do we check in with each other? How do we embody our values? How do we even speak about our values and have not just a mission about task, but a mission about culture, about how we want to work together? Mm -hmm. So for me, those are some of the parts of what we can put in place within our groups that are really helpful. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and a lot about that that you said seems to be about kind of just, just being, both being conscious of it and also getting out there having those conversations, um, which, you know, most of the conversations that you named there are ones that we, you know, conventionally just don't have. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and there's something about doing that kind of prep um, that, that I, um, you know, clearly makes conflict land really differently when it does come up in its kind of more, more intense forms. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, I'd like to just zoom out, if, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, I got very interested, uh, if, if you look at 
stuff that I've written about culture and that model that I was speaking about in week one in in not just the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems, but in how they show up as cultural archetypes. So in these archetypes of action and movement and doing and, you know, tasks, and the other archetype or another archetype that's often contrasted to it of love, relationship, being, inward. <clears throat> uh, and for me, I got interested in them because of an inquiry into burnout. Um, and this imbalance between the focus on task and the focus on relationships or well-being, the focus on outer and the focus on inner, that felt to me like it was at the heart of the burnout culture that we were creating in the transition movement mm -hmm. and that I felt was really present in the early days of Transition Network. Um, and I want to say something big about those. I think in our culture, because we're being organized by trauma states, we've we are very resistant to the being part of our lives because going inward feels frightening and we're under-resourced to meet what's there because there's a lot of pain that's not digested. So we focus on the outer and it means that we orient towards the material world rather than the inner life. Um, and, and I want to say uh, uh, an unhealthy culture puts all of its field of relationships in service to action. Mm. Right? And in our culture, we put home life in service to the economy. That's how we've done it politically. <clears throat> and a healthy culture is really clear that the only purpose of the economy is to support relationships and to support the next generation of children, you know, within families, communities, relationships, complexities. Mm. So a question for me is how we embody that principle in our groups mm. and how we don't con continually sacrifice our relationships within the group in order to get the job done. Um, and when I've been at conferences where there's been a mix of more global north and some indigenous, you know, still living a intact, what I would call more healthy, um, earth-based sustainable um, relational human culture one of the things that I really noticed is that the elders of those communities are wanting to do ceremony to heal our relationships mm. and for them that's uh, that's what I've seen it's, that's been the priority uh, and it would make no sense you know this is my belief is it would make no sense to make an action plan while the relationships are still broken while men and women still don't really trust each other or white people and black people are still um, not understanding how profoundly we're divided in this culture. Um, and until, you know, until we heal these things, how can we go forward together? Mm. Um, and I think there's a fundamental lack of understanding of that within a lot of progressive movements. We're still caught in what I think is an unhelpful frame that action is what's going to save us, yeah. um, and I don't think it is. I think the, you know, I think the the thing that's going to transform us is finding that return path where we learn to reconnect with ourselves, each other, and the world. Mm -hmm. So that's it's that's a bit of a we've gone out. I've gone out to the really big picture, mm -hmm. um, but I think it's helpful to to see those principles and then to ask the question. How does that show up in my working day, in my relationships, in my groups, in our movement for change? You know, how do we keep putting relationships at the centre and you know, and in our communities? Yeah. Mm, it's fascinating. And it does, you know, you can see how in a really fragmentary way, something about this um, coronavirus lockdown has enabled some people to have a bit of that. Um, a bit you know, of which? a bit of that um rest a bit of that yeah. that that uh you know a, a, a break from the ongoing consistent constant pressure to perform um and clearly you know lots of people have have been left behind and have um you know had a much worse time but there's a there's a chunk of people who've had something pretty unusual um yeah. i think that's really interesting Mm. Yeah. yeah and and the, and and both suddenly people being at home more and sometimes parents 
finding what it is to be with their kids instead of their, you know, work, school, childcare. Mm-hmm. But also the, the, the aspect of loneliness, isn't it, of not having the contact. I think it's really interesting what's going to come out of this about relationships. Yeah. What yeah. what we are learning about relationships in it. So yeah, thank you for doing that. Yeah. Just to, to round this one off, or or maybe not, maybe to dig a little deeper. Um, you wanted to talk also about about like so what happens in that conflict field when we're when we're in there and we've got in deep and things are feeling really crappy. Mm. Um what 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 are the what are the kind of principles and practices that you're seeing that, that that support us in there and support us to get our feet back on into a more resourced place? Yeah, yeah. I I think I think all that I really want to say in this in this one is I think it's really helpful to understand the physicality of conflict and to be able to track uh, where I am on that nervous system state map. Because once I'm once I've got an amygdala hijacking, you know, once my brain is flooded with adrenaline, I actually am not in the present moment anymore, probably, and I probably can't hear what you're saying. Um, and there's no point in trying to resolve conflict or address anything in this present moment from that place. Um, so, so I think that's all I want to say. Maybe, maybe, and maybe that's what we'll unpack in the in the third one that we're doing, which is more about tools and practices. Which is to really look at when we're when we're stuck in it. What are the principles that help us to navigate that territory as well as possible? Um, because I think that is a big conversation in itself. Um, but I think that first principle to, is just to to have an understanding of the landscape. Um, and to support ourselves to to do what we can to keep coming back to that place where there's ground. You know, once we've lost our ground, we just need to stop, come back to the ground. And all of those practices that I spoke about at the beginning, appreciation, um, you know, celebration, connection, uh, I think are patterns that help, even though it can feel excruciating to say something appreciative about that person that you really want to kill right now. Actually, <clears throat> there's something enormously <clears throat> helpful if you can find a way to do that. Yeah. Great. <clears throat> okay, well, that's a good um, teaser trailer for our next week. Um, but that, that's wonderful. Thank you very much. And it was wonderful to see your beautiful face again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Eva. It's lovely to be with you too. Thank Easy. you. Bye-bye. Bye now.